Good evening and welcome to the ninth Four Corners Festival. Who would have believed that we're, we're getting as far as nine? And for a whole lot of those festivals, we have been trying to get John Paul Lederach to come and speak at Four Corners. Four Corners is an event that tries to bring people from across the city. Uh, usually what we're trying to do is we're trying to take people from east to west, from south to north, trying to get us to move into venues we might never have been in before, to listen to people we might never have listened to before, to give a safe space for conversation and some inspiration to try and bring uh, peace and well-being across the city of Belfast. So we're delighted to have John Paul Lederach with us. He is world renowned and you are thoroughly going to enjoy that. This year, we are looking at the theme, breathe. It seems to me that we're in a time when we need to breathe in. Get a chance for some calm in the middle of all that is going on in the world around us. To breathe in the grace, the peace, the shalom of God. And to find some solace in that, some resilience in that. And then also to breathe out, to breathe out hope, to breathe out inspiration, imagination, love, the warm, sweet breath of God's love breathed in and breathed out. That's what we're attempting to do. And there's a whole range of events going on right throughout the rest of the week. Please go on to the Four Corners Festival.com website and not only see what's happening there, but register for the events. You can also support the festival by sending donations into the festival on the site. Or if you want to become friends of the festival, we've had a, a number of people have done that over the last year. And it has just helped us over the year to be able to be financially fluid, to be able to have a ninth festival. If you want to do that, the information is there. But enough of that. We want to get down to business. So uh, let me uh, just say that we're delighted to have you with us tonight. And I'll hand you over to Gladys Gagnon and she'll take it from here. So good evening and you're all very welcome to the 2021 Four Corners Festival, the lockdown edition. I'm Gladys Scaniel and I'm a sociologist at Queen's University as well as a member of the Four Corners Planning Committee. We are honored and excited to have three amazing guests with us tonight to get the festival started. The theme of this year's festival is Breathe. Our contributors have been asked to offer us their insights and meditations about what it means to breathe out hope in this most challenging time for Belfast and the wider world. Our contributors need no introduction, but I will say a few brief words to orient to you about how our evening will proceed. First, we'll hear from John Paul Lederach, Professor Emeritus of International Peace Building at the University of Notre Dame, USA. He's a world leading expert on conflict transformation and the author of some 22 books. His work has been informed by his personal faith and a deep knowledge of Christian scriptures and has influenced the way we have thought about conflict transformation in Northern Ireland. Then we'll hear from Raquel McKee, a teacher, poet, singer, songwriter, dramatist, novelist, and storyteller who was born in Jamaica and lives in Belfast. She will be followed by Padre Gotuma, a poet and theologian who brings interests in language, violence, and religion to his work. After their contributions, John Paul will offer a short response. Then it will be back to me for a few brief words before musician Johnny Fitch takes us out with an original composition, Breathe, written by Johnny Fitch and Steve Stockman. There will be a chance to ask questions of Professor Lederach in the In Conversation event at 5 p.m. on the 3rd of February supported by the Senator George J. Mitchell Institute at Queen's University. And also please join us tonight at 10, 10 p.m. for night prayers. So John Paul, it's over to you. Uh, hello everyone. I'm honored to be a part of the launching of the Four Corners Festival 2021. I'm asked to speak to the verb breathe. At once simple and at once profoundly complex. Each of us is breathing right now. We do it every day, every hour, every second. Breathe is the single most shared human experience. We may not share common ground, but not one of us escapes sharing common air. 
Breathe contains the most profound paradoxes of life. Weaving what appears opposite and even contradictory into a hidden expansive whole. Inhale and exhale, always present, nearly always invisible, invaluable, yet rarely esteemed, living both within and between us. Paradoxes do not lend themselves to logical and rational explanation. They do not seek to be solved. They invite a wander and a ponder, the search for wholeness unfolding at the speed of spirit. Breathe, inhale, exhale, opposites. Try doing just one. Every doorway, a threshold between worlds. Openness, the key. I set out on a wander in search of the four corners. I followed the not always visible pathways into the image scapes and the soundscapes of the verb breathe. 20 ponderings and an epilogue emerged. One, it's only air weighs nothing, comes and goes, in and out, seen when frozen, only noted when disappeared. It's only air. Two, from the dust, from the earth, from mud, a shape was formed, then nothingness left its source and entered the dust. Writers of old say it was the moment when the mud came alive, when the dirt billowed and walked, dust being. Three. This coronavirus has infected my writing. It has become mud and muddling. I cannot sense an audience. I do not know who I am writing to. Maybe I am just writing to myself. After all, we seem to muck about in quarantine these days, mumbling to ourselves between four walls, forgetting our mute button is off. I have lost sight of form. My writing wheezes along like an anarchist, landing somewhere between poetry and prose whilst refusing them both. Some days I start a good essay. Thoughts roll like clouds across a vast sky. By evening, the pages have become a haiku, a random drop of rain in a desert. I can never tell if that one drop is clear and dear or lost before it even lands. A gem or nothingness. Four, I have pondered on nothingness over this past year. It started when Yates paid me a visit. Yes, I refer, I refer here to William Butler. He was not permitted to visit, of course, what with quarantine and all, but he made his way, or should I say, I made way to notice his presence. Five, how nothingness becomes somethingness. Step one, take note of what has always been present with in and all around you. Six, the few words I remember from my conversation with William Butler are these. I shall arise and go now. And 
for peace comes dropping slow. We were sitting under a Palo Verde tree here in Tucson, Arizona, April 25, 2020, just at dawn, full lockdown, but I was lucky to have a tree in full bloom on the front patio. The crack was good when he held up his hand and stopped talking. Complete stillness. Then our silence opened in to a wondrous droning buzz from above. The flowers seemed to be talking. Seconds ticked into minutes until he turned and asked, now do you hear what I mean? His voice was grainy like an old BBC audio, but there it was, the bee loud glade arched like a music shell overhead. I madly wrote these words in my sketch pad and when I went to show him, he was gone. When the sun crests, the bees come. They drink till drunk and can't stop singing. They drop me flowers, their wings on my face, breath of God. Even small, fragile, nearly nothings move air and push ripples. Maybe when we say, thinking of you, prayers beat like wings, pushing a bit of air. It's worth a thought. Seven, I never had a chance to be present with you in person and in place for one of these Four Corners festivals. I wondered where the Four Corners were located. That was my first image, the Four Corners as a place. We always take whatever arrives and place it in what is already known so that we can name what it means. Eight, how nothingness becomes somethingness, step two. Place the unknown in a place with a face and name the known place and then name that face and you will know your place. Place the unknown in a place with a face and name the known place and then name that face and you will know your place. We call this seeing what I mean. Nine. Close to where I live now, we call the place where the states of Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico meet, the Four Corners region. It holds the voice trace and presence of the Anasazi, the ancient ones, the ancestral Puebloans. Today, the Diné, the Ute, and the Hopi inhabit and make home in these lands. It only takes a breath to say their names. The nothingness of air moving up from the lungs past the vocal cords, rippling a vibration that forms a word, a name, audible even across oceans. Say their names. Breathe and nothingness ripples. 10. My image of the Four Corners Festival took me to a place, but where? I decided I would ask. I wrote to Belfast friends, a couple of professors, a politician, a few mediators, a city government leader. What do you consider the most famous Four Corners in Belfast? By which I mean a place where two streets cross and create Four Corners. It seemed simple logic. I was looking for a map, a compass, even the magic of a child's riddle and rhyme to arrive where the four corners meet. Of course, you must follow a street. 11. I have wandered many cities, quite a few where the local Puebloans have suffered 
and traversed layers of storied harm. Walk the streets and both dust and stories will rise. Over the years, I learned that in contested cities with storied streets, people carry three maps. One map tells you where you are and where to put your feet to stay alive. Those maps always have where there be dragons spitting fire at the frayed edges of unnamed streets. One map you carry in the cells of your body. It holds all the streets that came before you. It tells you which streets tell which stories and give you the story that sorts out all other stories. This map keeps alive as long as you follow the story. Everyone tells you that you were born to breathe. The third map doesn't speak much. At most, it whispers. It's the one with hidden hints that maybe other not yet seen streets exist and that the ones that speak and spit have names that can change. If spoken, these yet to be named streets permit you to come alive. It's the dust being dream, the mystery you might choose to born. Stay alive, keep alive, come alive. Ah, oh, but which map to choose and when? 12. In one of my early visits to Bogota, at the height of another wave of violence in Colombia, I stayed at the home of a close friend, a human rights lawyer, a peace builder, he had lived for years with threats to his life. Every morning and evening, we walked to and from a gathering that we had convened. And each day we went out and came back by way of a different set of streets. By the fourth day, I realized our wandering was not for tourism's sake. I notice we're taking a different route every time we walk, I observed. You know, it's great, but I have no idea how to get home on my own. We kept walking. Yes, he agreed. You are trying to find your way by looking at street names. I am listening for the streets to breathe and talk stories about what is here but not seen as a way to assure that we both get home alive. 13. Paul Brady's song titled The Island holds the phrase, and we're still at it in our own place. Maybe in your head, you heard the melody and sang the next line. From another of your great poets, this one comes to mind. Whatever you say, say, well, we've been having troubles over here in the land of the free with our maps and compasses spinning wild, with the stories we're told and choose to tell, with who gets to call what place home, with streets without names and names that can't breathe, layers on layers of dust and dirt, the nothingness of silence, the weight of silently waiting for hurt and shame to find their proper name. You can find those street talking stories on almost any city in America, if you are listening.
Last week, a playwright friend set out a call to celebrate Elijah McLean's birthday. He is seeking 100 playwrights to write 10 plays, each with a maximum of 25 words, to be performed on February 25, 2021, when Elijah would have been 25. 1,000 plays to celebrate the moment when the breathing began in this wondrous embodied gift given to this earth. I thought I might try. Since Elijah's spirit flew on August 30, 2019, and investigations hotted up a year later when George Floyd equally lost his somethingness in a wisp of nothingness, information became more publicly available. I found the audio of the last 151 words spoken by Elijah. His voice present, but invisibilized below the police jawing over top his body on their discarded camcorders. Weightless air pushed up from his lungs past his vocal cords and out into the deaf numbed world until his last nothing was no more. The verb breathe appears in the first and the final sentence of those last 151 words. Streets hold stories. Say his name, Elijah McLean, the prophet spoke. 14. The hardest three words to hear in America. I can't breathe. The hardest three words to say in America, I am racist. 15. A friend recently told me a different story about Belfast. It was as if she had the three maps in a conversation with her children who had all become adults during the troubles. One of her boys said, it's odd, but when I walk home from downtown Belfast, even if it's the long way around, after all these years, my feet still follow the old streets. 16. While I waited for my Belfast friends to email me with their choice of where the four corners are located, I searched for what the founders said about this festival. I discovered I had the image wrong, inverted. It is not where the four corners meet, but searching for how the deep corners can shed their grip. In their original words, we're hoping to entice people out of their corners and into new parts of the city. My Belfast Pueblo and Friends email responses started to arrive. Only one place was shared in common. Several chose Belfast City Hall. While that may not strike us as representing a place where two streets cross and create four corners, they suggested it is here where the four corners of the city gather just as the building's wings look back onto the four quadrants. More emails returned. Longer than expected emails showed up. People could not just choose one set of corners or if they did, they felt a need to describe in some detail 
each of the streets and the stories of those corners. They were not answering what's most famous. They shared what corners most inspired them. One image cohered, corners as beacons. But they described the oddest of beacons, one that holds both light and sound. These corners inspired because they held the echoes of the past pain while offering light towards something new, a place where remembering met dreaming and where each was needed to untether the other. 17. In the past months, I started writing a book. Alas, my crazy corona-infected writing has not found its way forward quite yet. This book speaks to the many in my country who, who seek to speak quick and neat about the dire need to ease our speak into healing with the recipes for how to unify and reconcile sometime between now and the startup of our next election in 2022, which began last week. For peace comes dropping slow is not always well understood on this side of the ocean. I titled the book On Social Healing. Chapter one opens with the heading, Departure Points, Learning to Live Between. The poet's quote to start the chapter draws from Emily Dickinson. Forever is composed of nows. The first sentence of chapter one, social healing unfolds between memory and imagination. Social healing unfolds between memory and imagination. If the book is ever written, it will conclude with the same line. Breathe, memory, imagination, opposites. Try doing just one. 18. How does one untether the past and the future to each be their full, robust, and nurturing selves and find their invisible whole? This past year, I did write one book, well, sort of, it is titled, Rebuilding the Lost Lexicon of the Undictionary. The Undictionary has 20 or so entries. It is like breathe. It's just finished. It just started. It is always incomplete. I have invited people to submit entries. Here are a few that seem relevant to our festival ponderings. To untether. The freedom inherent in accepting that you do not control things. To untether. The freedom inherent in accepting that you do not control things. To unknow. To suspend attachment to what is held most dear. Also unknow, as in to wonder and wander. The Desert Fathers referred to the home of unknowing as a cloud, to unsee, the ability to let the eye of your inner soul sit at the edge of your skin in order to feel the humanness of another, the ability to let the eye of your inner soul sit at the edge of your skin in order to feel the humanness of another. Ophthalmologists refer to this as blind faith. Example, Jacob said to Esau, to unsee your face is to see the face of God. Note, some theologians contest this translation. 19. 
to be enticed out of our corners, to walk into that which is unknown and to unknow and unsee what has been assumed true, that walking will require some serious wandering and pondering. We will need to choose our streets. We will need to arise and go along the wear and tear of feet hitting streets in the clouds of dust and dirt that will kick and bellow Beacons and voices on the corners will also rise if we watch and listen. Can this cloud of dust carry dreams? Only when nothingness breathes from the bowels to the breast and into the beyond. Is not hope to breathe? Is not hope always found in the billow of dust that has been breathed alive. 20. Freud once remarked that wherever he had been, the poets had been there before him. My last ponder comes from a poet in my land who went before me in harder times on rougher streets. James Mercer Langston Hughes. Gather out of stardust, earth dust, cloud dust, and splinters of hail. One handful of dream dust, not for sale. Epilogue. How nothingness becomes somethingness. Step Three, as cited from the recipe card of Howard Thurman. Don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lederach. I'm honored to have been invited to be part of this event, the opening ceremony of the Four Corners Festival 2021. Thank you very much to the team of the festival for having me. And thank you very much for your words of wisdom, your wonderings and ponderings tonight so far. Prof. I feel privileged to have been asked to respond to you alongside Padraig. I have three poems to share. At the start of your speech, Professor Lederach, you referred to breath as the single most shared human experience. And you went on to say, not one of us escapes sharing common air. This speaks to me of the unity of human beings in our requirement for breath. My first piece tonight is entitled, Time for Your Breath of Hope. Every corner of Belfast City, through Botanic and Napoleon's nose, Newtonard's Road and across the Falls Road, the same sort of feelings grow. Prospects extracted from business ideas, dreams once bursting, no little luck sure, bills escalating beyond the furlough. It's time for your breath of hope. Mister, it's time for your breath of hope. Open the curtains and let in the light. Cross the peace walls and see things anew. Stream in the festivals and turn down the night. Examine our thoughts and renew. Mortar resilience into every foundation. Brick upon brick, let it rise. Till hope is opaque and substantial and strong. A shine like a pupil in our eye. 
till who pa shine like a pupil in our eye. It's not lost on me that one of the impacts of COVID-19 is respiratory failure, the inability to breathe. It is significant that what has brought the world to a standstill is something that threatens our dependence on God. Breath is God's gift. Ruach, the Holy Spirit, is the breath of God that fills humanity with life. This next piece is called Ruach, the breath of hope. All across the globe, human beings gasp for breath as the invisible demonstrates our indivisible dependence on that which we have not created. Breath which initiated life and thought and creativity and gives us the capacity for evil and for good. Capacity to choose which views to reject and which to embrace. Modus operandi with its biases and flaws or a lifestyle of grace to all, regardless of the majority or minority of our presence, knowing that the very essence of breath is reason to hope. The very essence of breath is reason to hope. We leave our corners and breathe. Ruach, we breathe out hope for good. We watched many before Elijah McLean, then George Floyd breathe their last. And in that present, past met future with a no. Time to disrupt the status quo and take my knee off someone's throat. Time to arrest my privilege, to give ground to those that I smother. Time to mother those that I other. Time to dismantle the long held views of who's acceptable and why. Time to cry for their pain and my loss, insisting on my gain. Time to help someone to breathe. Time to nurse humanity's mental health need with a breath of fresh perspective, knowing that the very essence of breath is reason for hope. The very essence of breath is reason for hope. We leave our corners and breathe. Ruach. We breathe out hope for justice. Inhale, we catch your breath, Ruach, and exhale past the curve, the R number, the mortality rate. Exhale hope for the state of humanity as we stop long enough to see our unity and our interdependence. We pick up the whimper of those struggling to breathe, applauding the medics, activists, philanthropists and therapists who ventilate and recuperate because they appreciate the fragility of humanity, knowing that the very essence of breath is reason to hope. The very essence of breath is reason to hope. We leave our corners and breathe. Ruach, we breathe out hope for healing. Professor Lederach has spoken of paradoxes. One of the paradoxes of this time, in my estimation anyway, is that immortal breath has created a fixation on human mortality, far surpassing the importance of our immortality. He quoted Emily Dickinson with forever 
is composed of nows. But my question is, do all of our nows make forever? Ruach, your long loan offered to loam now set as preeminent to eternity. Our earthly constructs too tangible for immortality constricts the supernatural with the visible. Life in the now, a supreme priority, fed with research, vaccines, conveniences to the abstraction of our future home with far more longevity than our blink of time. Help us esteem the gift of your breath, knowing that the very essence of breath is reason to hope. The very essence of breath is reason to hope. We leave our corners and breathe. Ruach, we breathe out hope for eternity. Professor Lederach talked about the nothingness. And in Genesis chapter one, verse two, it says, and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. When nothingness is like a sea, your heart of hope stays near. Translucent hope, barely substantiated in the deep darkness, stretching its void over vision. Thick cloud that shrouds expectation the new normal that saps our time with FaceTime, Zoom, the same old rooms, still waiting for news of the new. New friends, new places, new holiday destinations, new norms of justice, new scope, new reasons to hope. We breathe, knowing that the very essence of breath is reason to hope. The very essence of breath is reason to hope. We leave our corners and we breathe. Ruach, we breathe out hope for growth. Professor Lederach has proposed some relevant onwards for the undictionary. So taking that thought, I thought, what would I propose for the undictionary? And having recently watched Planet Earth, a user's guide on BBC with my son, who I discovered is the optimal age for making a change in this world, I thought that maybe I would suggest the word. My word would be uncarbon for the undictionary. So as we arise and go now, like Yeats, to unsee climate change with a handful of dream dust not for sale like Langston Hughes, we can transform industry to cleaner, more carbon efficient technology as we find commercially viable ways to split water and make hydrogen energy storable and safe. That dream dust, it can transform the aviation industry. It can reduce the carbon footprint of developed countries. And it can stem the tide of climate injustice in the unguilty developing world. My final piece is a micro poem and it's called On Carbon. On Carbon to unsee the unguilty, unknow climate injustice, we must begin to uncarbon and unconvenience our lifestyles or uninherit the wealth of the earth. Thank you very much for listening.
And thank you very much to Gladys and the Four Corners team for having me. I hand you over now to Padre. Thanks very much, Raquel and John Paul, and to the Four Corners people. Um, it's a lovely thing to be with you. Um, and it's nice to all be um, breathing together here. I've been thinking about breath um, as part of this invitation and thinking through what Raquel and John Paul were saying about breath and breathing. Um, I'm always interested in etymology, the uh, architecture of language. And um, the word um, breath um, can also be understood as the word spirit. And I'd like to make that connection with you. The word spirit comes from the word in Latin, spirare, meaning breathe. And so to breathe is to be in spirit. And to be in spirit is therefore deeply connected with the meatiness of our own lungs. So breath, while on the one hand, seems to be something intangible. You know, you can't see it unless it's frosty or smoky. Um, but while we can't see it under ordinary circumstances, we can see the body move. And without that happening, without the lungs contracting, without the diaphragm lifting, without the body bringing oxygen in and spreading all that all around through um, blood, we would die. If we don't breathe, we die. Perhaps another way of saying this is, if we don't spirit, we die. When we die, we cease breathing. And because the word breath, spirare, is at the heart of words like inspiring and inspirational and spirituality and dispirited, we can see that the notion of spirit also isn't merely some misty abstract notion. In fact, the word spirit is entirely tied up with our meaty lungs or lung for some people we have in our body. Spirituality is not abstract. Spirituality is not about the ineffable. Spirituality is not about the intangible. Spirit breath is about the deeply meaty. Anyway, all this is a little bit of an introduction to tell you a short story. Last year, one morning while I was in yoga, deep breathing in and out, in and out, a friend died. Yoga often ends in savasana, which means corpse pose. You lie on after your yoga practice as still as you can. And the idea is that all of the postures you've held in a yoga class are gathering in your body and releasing in your body. And to hold in that small foretaste of death is a way of um, coming to terms with the temporality of life, coming to terms with the fact that breath is only in our bodies for a particular period of time. But then I got word afterward that my friend had died around the same time that I'd been in corpse pose. And for months afterwards, I couldn't be in corpse pose. I couldn't do it. I'd cry or I'd get up or I'd get angry or somehow my body would object. I'd have a sore back because there's memory and breath. And we can recall about how there's wisdom and insight in breath and how there's emotion in breath. There can be angry breathing. There can be loving and passionate breathing. There can be all kinds of breathing, nervous breathing. As we know, and it's 2020 and into 2021 has been a reminder for us. Sometimes someone else can breathe for us, mouth to mouth perhaps. Artificial lungs can breathe for us in hospital, respirators things that spirit for us until we can do it for ourselves again. I have very bad asthma, so I know very well what the panicked feeling of waking up in the middle of an asthma attack is like. Usually I imagine I'm about to be killed in my dream and then something wakes me up, myself or Paul shaking me awake because I sounded like I was about to choke. When people sing together, their heartbeats sink. And breath, I think, reminds us of that strange thing, that we are alone and we are together. I can never be breath for someone else for too long. They can't be spirit enough for me forever. Yet to not to give into a community, to not be in spirit with each other, to not be in breath, will lead to what we have felt this year, which is isolation. Somehow we need to find a way to be alone when we're together and also to be together when we're alone. So I'll finish with two poems. Um, one is about the need to be with, and one is about the need to be alone. 
Uh, the first is a sonnet. Sonnet is a word meaning a little song. Um, it's called Jacob and Esau. And Jacob and Esau are the sons of Isaac. And um, one tricked the other to get the inheritance of the other. One was smooth and subtle, and the other was hairy and oafish. Um, but later in life, much later on, both as patriarchs, really, they make a trip to see each other. They couldn't continue to live without some kind of reconciliation. And they didn't reunite. They only met once, and then they parted again. So they wandered towards each other. They met each other. They gave gifts. They kissed. They cried. They parted again. Along the way, Jacob wrestled with an angel and had his name changed and came away with a limp. Here's the poem, a little sonnet. Jacob and Esau. One day I repented my resentment because I realized I'd forgotten to repeat it. For a while, no, for a long while, it was like a prayer rising to the skies, morning after morning, like a siren that wouldn't quiet. And then I remembered other things. The way I walk lighter these days. The way you never knew my story of divorce. The way I am tired of being forced among the new. And the way I miss having someone to speak to about things I don't need to explain. The way we shared a name. So I decided. I took a flight and hung around the areas where we used to meet. I loitered with intent. I was hungry with hope, but couldn't eat alone. I miss the home your body was, even though we're grown now. I missed your smell, your wrestle, your snoring breath. And when I saw you, I saw you'd changed too. So much behind us, we didn't need to name. These two brothers, Jacob and Esau, how many decades had they carried their resentments toward each other? How much breath had they poured into stoking that story of resentment, that singular story they held about each other? And what relief in the body, what new parts of the lungs can you breathe into when you finally get to the stage where you say, I'll admit to my wrongdoing. I'll take whatever comes with it. I will find the breathing relief the spirit in the space where I can simply tell the truth of my own wrongdoing. Here's the last poem. It's called How to Be Alone. I've been plagued with self-consciousness all my life and parties um, especially could be awful. Would anyone talk to me? Would I look alone? Would I feel awkward? I wouldn't know what to do with my hands and I'd feel self-conscious about my body and my breathing wouldn't relax. So here's a poem about that. After this, I'll hand back to John Paul. How to be alone. It all begins with knowing nothing lasts forever. So you might as well start packing now. In the meantime, practice being alive. There will be a party where you'll feel like nobody's paying you attention. And there will be a party where attention is all you'll get. What you need to do is to remember to talk to yourself between these parties. And again, there will be a day, a decade, where you won't fit in with your body, even though you're in the only body you're in. You need to control your habit of forgetting to breathe. Remember when you were younger and you practiced kissing on your arm? You were onto something then. Sometimes harm knows its own healing. Comfort knows its own intelligence. Kindness too. It needs no reason. There is a you telling you another story of you. Listen to her. Where do you feel anxiety in your body? The chest, the fist, the dream before waking, the head that feels like it's at the top of the swing or the clutch of gut like falling and falling and falling and falling. It knows something. You're dying. Try to stay alive. For now, touch yourself. I'm serious. Touch yourself. 
take your hand and place your hand some place upon your body and listen to the community of madness that you are. You are such an interesting conversation. You belong here. Thank you, uh, Raquel and Padraig. Uh, um, I'm uh, without words to know how to adequately capture um, the resonance that I felt from your sharing and from the poem. So I have, without the benefit of the words on page uh, before me, um, just captured a few lines that that jumped out at me uh, in a way that held me such that I couldn't hear the next lines that were coming. I guess that's what you might say. So starting with Padraig, then back to Raquel. If we don't spirit, we die. I think it's such an extraordinary um, insight and that it's the meaty, meaty lungs, not ephemeral, not um, abstract, but incarnated. I saw you changed too. What an extraordinary line. What an extraordinary insight. Uh, so much is said in those few words to see, to notice change, and to see that it's almost like breath, both. Harm, harms no, harms no its own feeling. How much uh, we seek somebody else's expertise and we tend to run the world offering expertise about the things that maybe deep down inside we know somehow that we can touch. So it's powerful. Uh, thank you for that, Padraig. And Raquel, I, the repeated lines captured me so much over and again. The very essence of breath is reason for hope. The very essence of breath is reason to hope. Um, just such an extraordinary line. Um, I jotted one line also, which had to do with the ways that you wove this notion that this is a year to uh, understand our mutual humanity. And in so doing, to, to raise up the capacity uh, not to point fingers about who's to blame, but to see ourselves as a part of that. It's not theirs, but it's also ours. And um, there were, were such extraordinary set of lines that I that came forward that I couldn't get them all down at one time. So I'm looking forward to seeing them. But it had to do with the times of George Floyd and Elijah McClain being a firm no to the future. And then you went into this extraordinary set of ways of understanding how the moment is created and that moment is now for us to look carefully at who we are and to see our part in this, not to take apart what someone else has done. Um, and in many ways that that is um, the potential for the immortal. That is the potential for that which is, can go on and bring us alive and give life. The very essence of breath is reason for hope, has embedded within it justice and grace that you appealed to. But an appeal that, at least as I was experiencing, asked me to notice myself my privilege, my place, uh, as connected to that bigger picture of the things that need to be brought forward. Um, 
I'll stop there. I don't know what more to add to such extraordinary poets. Thank you both very, very much. Now it's left to me to thank our three speakers and also to kind of close out the evening before uh, handing over to the music by Johnny Fitch. And I suppose um, what stood out for me tonight was I was simply reminded that um, poetry is in a sense prophecy. And I think we've heard uh, from three, three prophets tonight um, beamed out over Belfast and other parts of the world. And I'm really grateful and thankful for that. And for me, I think the response um, to that is prayer. So I just want to lead us in a short uh, prayer where I read out some phrases from the three um, contributions. And I invite you to just relax, close your eyes if that's your thing, or just uh, relax in whatever way uh, makes you feel comfortable. And I'll read a few phrases um, before closing us out um, and handing over to Johnny. Breath is the single most shared human experience. We can wander many cities with three maps, to stay alive, to keep alive, or to come alive. How might you choose to come alive? Elijah McLean was the prophet who spoke. What has he said to you? There are beacons on our corners. Where are they leading us? Healing unfolds between memory and imagination. Watch for the beacons on the corners. Open the curtains and let in the light till hope shines like a pupil in a wee eye. We leave our corners and we breathe. We breathe out hope for good. The very essence of breath is reason to hope. To breathe is to be in spirit. I was hungry with hope, but I couldn't eat alone. Listen to the community of madness that you are. You belong here. We all belong together. Amen. Breathe in, breathe out Run the other way from all the doubt Jesus, he is here in all our disarray Beaten by the night to resurrection day We need a breath of hope in this fire of space In this body of death we need a kiss of grace Breathe out Breathe out We need a kiss of grace in this valley of death In this fire of space we need a breath of hope Breathe out Breathe out Will we meet the dark? Or will we meet the death? Or will we meet the kiss? Or will we meet the breath? Or will we meet the dark? Or will we meet the death? Or will we meet the kiss? Or will we be the breath? Breathe in. Breathe out. Look up from the dark and see the spirit is creating. Look up from the dark and you see the light sailing on the sea, tossed around by the swell. 
fix eyes, press on, get to know Emmanuel. We need a breath of hope in this dying place, in this valley of death. We need a kiss of grace. Breathe out, breathe out. We need a kiss of grace in this valley of death, in this dying place. We need a breath of hope. Breathe out, breathe out. Will we mean the dark? Or will we mean the death? Or will we mean the kiss? Or will we mean the breath? Oh no no, will we mean the dark? Will we mean the death? Or will we mean the kiss? Or will we be the breath? Breathe in. Breathe out, run the other way from all the doubt. Thanks for watching. We really hope you've enjoyed this event and have taken away a challenge and we'll come back to other events in our annual festival. We're deeply grateful to our funders, particularly the Executive Office, the Department of Foreign Affairs, and Belfast City Council through its Good Relations Programme. We'd also like to thank our loyal friends at the festival who donate regularly throughout the year, as well as everyone who has donated to us in the lead up to and during this year's festival. Your support is invaluable in enabling the festival to grow and become more sustainable. The coronavirus pandemic means that I can't hold up this Tesseract collection box this year as I do annually. But I encourage you to support the cost of running and developing the festival by visiting fourcornersfestival.com slash donate and making a one-off gift or signing up as a friend of the festival. Finally, feedback and funders go hand in hand. So although we can't hand you a paper feedback form on the way out the door, we'd appreciate if you could fill in our online form at fourcornersfestival.com slash feedback. We sat back breathed and decided that the 2021 festival would carry on virtually. We hope you'll be able to join us in person next year as we continue to connect people from across the city of Belfast and beyond, encouraging us out of our own corners in order to encounter new perspectives and new ideas and the possibility of making new friends. Thank you.